Morning. Morning. So back in the 20s, there's this lady named Betty Crocker. Anybody ever heard of Betty Crocker? Yeah? Her notoriety manifested uh, once she began answering customer questions on behalf of the Washburn Cosby Company. Crosby, excuse me. By 1924, Betty Crocker was given her own radio show. She was also given a cooking school. And by 1945, she was considered to be one of the most widely known women in the country, second only to the First Lady. That sounds like a pretty good deal, doesn't it? Good for her. There, there is a problem, though, something worth noting. Betty Crocker never existed. It's not a real person at all. She was a total fabrication, completely made up, back in 1921 in an effort to personalize uh, responses with, with customers. Her signature was selected from a bunch of samples that were submitted by female workers of the Washburn Crosby Company. And the bottom line is this, is Betty Crocker, she make believe. Now the question of who is Betty Crocker is not important at all. It's more of like a, like a Paul Harvey anecdotal, now you know the rest of the story kind of thing. I mean, who cares really? Doesn't matter. Absolutely does not matter. A far more important, a far more relevant question would be maybe, oh, I don't know, who is Jesus? Maybe that's a, a little more of an important thing. And that's exactly the question that was asked by Jesus himself in the 8th chapter of Mark. So we're going to take a look at Mark chapter 8, verses 27 through 29, just a real short little passage. Starting at verse 27, the Bible reads, And Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And by the way, he asked his disciples, saying unto them, Whom do men say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, but some say Elias, and others one of the prophets. And he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Peter answereth and saith unto him, Thou art the Christ. So Jesus gathers his disciples together and says, Whom do men say that I am? At the time this question is being asked, he and his disciples are traveling through uh, the surrounding towns of Caesarea Philippi. Okay? Um, this is an area known also as uh, Ponino, and was also known as the home of the Greek god Pan. Also, before Caesarea Philippi became a Roman city and, and became forced to worship Caesar as a, as a living god, uh, they were also engaged in Baal worship. Has everybody been paying attention for the last couple of months? Like, we know what Baal worship is, right? That's, that's devil worship. Now, in addition to that, there were a bunch of Syrian gods that were also worshipped in the surrounding villages. I mean, it really is quite a, a cross-section, like more of like a hodgepodge of all these different pagan religions and practices and, and, and worship of pagan gods. So it's a really unique place for Jesus to ask such a question. And when he asks that question, uh, uh, a flurry of answers is given to Jesus by the disciples. Some say that he's John the Baptist. Some say that he's Elijah. Some people say that he's just, you know, perhaps one of the prophets, maybe like a Jeremiah or an Ezekiel or something like that. You know, who cares? It doesn't matter which one. <clears throat> Any one of them. He had to have been. And it's a question that reverberates throughout history. Who is Jesus? Like every thoughtful person has to have at one point raised that question in their own head and and filled in the blank as far as an answer goes. So many various popular answers. And they were appropriate back then and they're still used today. So we're going to take a look at some of those. The first one we're going to take a look at, the answer, who is Jesus? The answer is, Jesus is a pretty good guy. 
He's pretty cool. Right? Like, he's a good dude. Sure. A lot of people give a similar answer to this one. A lot of people. Even your non-Christians would be like, Jesus, I, you know, Jesus is just all right by me, or whatever that song is. Maybe I made that up. That is a song, isn't it? Okay, thank you. Everybody's like, what are you talking about? And the thing is, it's not even untrue. <clears throat> is it? I mean, Jesus, Jesus was a good guy. You know, I, maybe, maybe I'd upgrade it from pretty good guy to very good guy. That seems like a, a better way to say it. I mean, he showed that he was a friend to the poor. He went to bat for the lowest in society. He was loyal to the downtrodden. Someone that they could go to, someone they could trust. And in Matthew 7, 12, Jesus actually himself pens what we know as the, uh, uh, as the golden rule. Do unto others, blah, blah, blah. But while it is all true, like each and every bit of it is, is all true. Yeah, he's a good guy. He, Jesus is far, far more than that. In his own words, Jesus asserted that he was God and he did so in many different ways and on several occasions. His word echoed those found in the prophetic words of Daniel. If you look in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 to 14, the Bible reads, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. So, I mean, that sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? It's pretty unmistakable who Daniel's talking about. Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man repeatedly in the four Gospels. You might even say that that might have been his favorite way to refer to himself when it came to uh, revealing his deity to the disciples and, and to others. He does it 30 times in Matthew. 12 in Mark, 26 in Luke, and 9 times in the Gospel according to John. You add those up, it's documented over 75 times that Christ referred to himself as the Son of Man. But it's not the only title that he embraced. There was a time, I remember this one time, <laughs> when he's being questioned by a crowd of Jews. And they were asking him, how is it possible? How could you have possibly known Abraham? You're not even 50 years old, man. Like, explain that one. And he does. In John 8, 58, he responds to him. He says, verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. That's, that's big. That's one of those sacred names of God that was used in the Old Testament. I mean, God's name was, was the I am. Who shall I say sent me? You tell them I am sent you. Ooh, okay. <laughs> I will. And for Jesus to even say that, I mean, quite honestly, them's fighting words. Because you shouldn't claim to be the I am when clearly you're not, right? I mean, that's the sort of thing that make a crowd of people pick up stones and immediately start trying to stone somebody. Which, they tried. Jesus and the disciples, immediately, they had to skedaddle right out of there. But it doesn't end there. Jesus claimed to forgive sins. He claimed to be greater than Jonah, greater than Abraham, greater than Solomon, and even greater than John the Baptist. He exalted himself to be greater than the temple and even the Sabbath day. See, Jesus was a pretty good guy. Doesn't even begin to cover it. But that's not the only thing that people would say about Jesus. Here's another one. Jesus is a demented fool. I don't even like saying that. It's just weird to say. But other people would say that sort of thing. 
The reason being is that Jesus said things that, that made people not only double take, but that made, him, uh, made them consider him to be an outright lunatic. A lot of people thought Jesus was this, this sort of uh, a megalomaniac, like a, a, like a cult of personality sort of thing. Like your, like your Alexander the Greats or your, you know, your Adolf Hitlers or your Joseph Stalins. I mean, Jesus was looking to do a lot of changing. He was speaking and acting like a crazy person, somebody who was mentally disturbed. I mean, claiming to be God? It's crazy talk. You don't claim to be God. Yet here's the thing. The people that were devoted to Christ, they didn't turn into the followers of, of a megalomaniac. Right? Like that's not what happened to his followers. They didn't turn into murderers like, like the followers of Adolf Hitler. They didn't become power hungry like the followers of Joseph Stalin. That's, that's not what happened. They embraced his teachings. And they embraced the love that he brought with him. See, nobody led the way that Jesus did. Nobody taught the way that Jesus did. There was nobody like Jesus at all. It was for that reason that Jesus managed to, to win the admiration of people from all different levels of society, all different stations in life, little pockets of people, such an esteemed admiration for him. Jesus didn't turn people into carbon copy lunatics. That's, that's not what he did. So Jesus made them better. Right? He took some common fishermen right, and turned a few of them into some of the most esteemed and important authors the world has ever known. Jesus took the broken, he fixed them. He took those who were empty inside and he made them whole. He made the blind to see, he made the lame to walk, the mute to speak, the deaf to hear. He reattached ears to soldiers' heads, raised people from the dead. He did a lot of things to restore people. He wasn't some fringe lunatic. Another one Jesus is a deceiving fraud. There were a lot of people that thought that. Many that believed he was simply full of it. Scoffers called him a liar. He's not being truthful. He was a trickster, a huckster, a snake oil salesman who was just trying to, trying to drag people to their demise. A bunch of, bunch of hapless suckers. Gullible fools being, being just taken for a ride. The fact is that Jesus performed miracle after miracle after miracle. More than 30 recorded in the Gospels. And those miracles would demonstrate that he was no charlatan. We could spend a lot of time talking about the miracles, right? A lot of time. Like there's a sermon for every one of them, so there's no time for any of that. But I will say this about the miracles. It's something we need to understand, something we need to keep focus of, especially speaking of them in this context. Number one, Jesus didn't perform miracles to draw a crowd or, or to make a name for himself. Not to say that that's not what happened, because that's exactly what happened. But that's not why he did it. Another thing, all those miracles that he did, he never made one single penny off any of it. It wasn't about fame. It wasn't about money. It was a pure, genuine, tangible display of God's grace and love for us. For us, human beings, his greatest and most adored creation. Sometime around the year 120 AD, there was a historian by the name of Quadratus. 
Quadratus was, was what we would call one of the very first Christian apologists. You guys know what an apologist is? Apologetics? Anybody? Well, I'll tell you. It's not somebody who apologizes for being a Christian. Sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry, didn't mean to call you out on your sin. Sorry. I know, I know it's telling you that murder's wrong and you shouldn't steal things. Sorry about that. That's not an apologist. An apologist is someone who, who gives logical explanation for the Christian faith. Someone who you know, backs it up with facts. You know, rather than just, I just believe that way. I, that's just how I believe. You know, because we, we should have an answer for our faith. And that's what an apologist is. So this historian named Quadratus wrote to the Roman emperor Hadrian. And maybe that's how you say his name. But he wrote this. The works of our Savior were lasting for they were genuine. Those who were healed and those who were raised from the dead were seen not merely while our Savior was on earth, but also after his death. They were alive quite a while so that some of them lived even to our day. It's something we don't really think about very often, do we? There's a rich man's daughter, Lazarus. These people that Christ raised from the dead, they outlived Christ. They were still around afterwards to tell the tale. And while the testimony of the truth of Jesus Christ found in the words of Quadratus is great, it pales in comparison to the testimony of those people. And the effect that their testimony had is historically uh, uh, demonstrated and documented by the explosion of the New Testament church. Jesus was not just some snake oil salesman. There were so many opinions when it came to answering the question, who is Jesus? Some of them were dismissive. Some of them were just plain accusations. But regardless... The facts of what Jesus did while he was here on earth proved that he was far more than some lunatic charlatan. And Christ was so much more than just, just a pretty good guy. Peter. At Jesus' bidding one time, he walked on water. He was hands-on in helping to feed 5,000 men. He saw Jesus chase money changers out from the temple. Here was a guy who knew the deal. He saw it firsthand. So when Christ asked the, the same question directly to the disciples, Peter stepped up right away and pretty much nailed it. Peter answered, thou art the Christ. Peter saw it firsthand, but he wasn't the only one to see these things firsthand. A lot of people experienced these miracles, and a lot more witnessed them. And word got around, because everybody's got a couple of close friends that they could tell that to. By then you triple the, the amount of, of credibility in these things. And word spread. And even though that's the case, don't even know how it's possible, but somehow people managed to deny who Christ really was. Like Jesus fulfilled more, there are upwards of 400 Old Testament prophecies that concerned his birth, his life, and his death. And still, people could not accept and believe that he was the son of God. I'll tell you what, the reason for this, I'll tell you what the reason is. The reason they couldn't accept that is the same reason that Christ had to come to us anyway, in the first place. It's that dirty three-letter word, sin. 
See, the power of sin is not only destructive. It's not only the thing that drives a wedge between us and a very, very, very holy God. But sin is also blinding. Sin will make you not see things clearly. It gets in the way of our rational thinking because of the satisfying nature that it lends to our flesh. Our flesh and things of the spirit, man, it's like a square peg in a round hole. It just does not work. We don't like it. We shrug those things off. Most people at the time would rather have continued in their sin than to simply acknowledge the fact that they were in need of a savior. And because of that, they turned their back on Christ, they denied who he was, and they trivialized, trivialized who he was. Today isn't much different, is it? Like our whole world is a Caesarea Philippi. A land of many different gods. You got your Mormonism, your Buddhism, your Islamism, your Hinduism, your atheism, your secularism, your, your materialism. We're up to our eyeballs in isms. The world is so secular so secular that it's easier and more palatable to believe that Betty Crocker was a real person before they would want to believe that Jesus was the Son of God and that he was the Savior of humanity. But this next part right here is a testament to God's grace. And I love this because here's the deal. God loves us anyway. He loves us anyway. And he proved that. He showed us what he truly thinks about us when he came to die on the cross for you and I. And when he rose from the dead for us. Jesus did that so that we didn't have to feel the sting of death. He did that so, so we can share in life, after, ever, or life everlasting. And once and for all, we can shed these corruptible bodies and turn them in for some non-corruptible bodies. Is anybody ready for that? Anybody? Show of hands. I'm going to tell you what, man. Emily's not here today because uh, uh, she got up in the middle of the night and well, bad things happened. First of all, let me say this. My kid crawled into bed with us to announce that she was about to have bad things happen. Like, are you kidding me? <laughs> what, what in your head makes you think that this is the place that you do that? We have two bathrooms at the parsonage. And you're going to crawl in bed between my wife and I to announce that, Hey, Daddy, I don't feel so good. <laughs> Snuggling in. Nope. Go. So she went. Came back, slept in the bed with us for a little while. And here's the thing. Our bed's pretty cool for two people. Our bed's the worst for three. <laughs> so I woke up this morning, I had this little, like, this little stinger in my lower back, you know what I'm talking about? Where you wake up and you're just like, oh, dude, man, that, I can't get comfortable and everything hurts. I can't wait to get me one of those non-corruptible bodies. I can't wait to forget what back pain felt like. All that stuff. I'm so psyched for that. I cannot wait. You see, we all have friends that I'm sure could use one of those non-corruptible bodies too. But they're so caught up in what sin does for their flesh 
that it's hard for them to start thinking about the spiritual. That's where we come in. Our job is to preach the gospel. And I say our job. It's not everybody's job to be a pastor, but we're all called to tell everybody about Jesus. And that's what we should be doing. We should be taking all those people in our circle that could use a corruptible bo- or a non-corruptible body and making sure that they get one when it's all said and done. Because here's the thing, we all know people that are going to give that answer. Jesus was a pretty good guy. The other one I don't like, the other one I don't like, sidebar, your honor, sidebar. Uh, A lot of the modern translations change the word master to teacher. Which opens the door for Jesus was a pretty good teacher. We sure was. I had a lot of teachers growing up. None of them were my master. There's a big difference there. I don't like that. I think it takes away from what Jesus really was. Because he was more than a teacher. He was more than a pretty good guy. And people in that circle are going to say that, that he, was a, he, was a, he was crazy. Or that he was a liar. Or some of this is my favorite one. Those people that are like, Jesus wasn't even a real person. Come on, man. If you're not going to read the Bible, at least read some kind of history book. Because you just sound dumb when you say something like that. <laughs> Like there's all sorts of writings about Jesus Christ. That man from Nazareth. So the people in our circle that we want to join us in glory are all going to give an answer when they're presented with the question. But what we want to do is we want to make sure that they give one answer. It's a very simple answer. But it's a very powerful answer. The answer to that question, who is Jesus, should be this. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. 